Uh, my name is Oli Lundqvist. I'm uh, representing the ISDS in this uh, shared session uh, with the uh, IASMAN, where we have the president of the IASMAN, Dr. Uh, Professor Higachiguchi. Uh, we are privileged to chair this session on enhanced recovery after surgery. Um, we have um, uh, an interesting program ahead, and we're going to run through the, the talks one after another and then have all the speakers come up for a discussion towards the end. So welcome, everyone. Uh, I'll just hand over for a few words um, from my co-chairman. So thank you very much, Ori, and then also Andrew, and then all of you. So uh, uh, this moment, we're very happy to this occasion to the ISDS and the ESMEN main sessions. Uh, everybody knows that it lasts already, but there's some area in the world, not yet. And in Japan also, we have the lot of elder people then, so when came to the hospital to get a surgery, or it's a numerous number of the, so elderly people. Then also, we have to do some weak patients, we have to give to some surgical stress. Then we need a so quick recovery from the uh, surgical stress. Then today we're very happy. We are talking and we're discussing about the illness in the world. So we'll touch to the Ori. Okay, so it's my pleasure to introduce our first speaker. It's Professor Dilip Lobo from um, Nottingham in the UK. He's um, a world-famous surgeon, has done a lot for enhanced recovery, not least within fluid balance, but he's covering a lot of the aspects. And actually, uh, his topic today is going to be a little bit more provocative than it is in the, in the uh, um, booklet. So uh, we asked him to talk about eras, dogmas, or evolution. Dilip, the floor is yours. Thank you, Oli, for the very kind introduction, and thank you to ISMN for the invitation to speak over here. Uh, so we are approaching the 25th anniversary of ERAS, and it has revolutionized post-operative care. Patients go home as early as two days after major surgery, and overall quality of life and quality of recovery is much better. However, the purpose of my talk today is to see how much of ERAS is dogmatic and how ERAS is evolving and whether the guidelines do change with time. So in traditional perioperative care, we starved our patients, we stressed them, and we drowned them in an excess of salt and water. And with ERAS, we now want to make patients eat and drink as early as possible and mobilize as early as possible and be relatively pain-free. And this concept of dreaming uh, is what patients should be aiming for. Now, we know that Henry Kalet started this revolution in 1995 when he published this series of uh, case, uh, cases in The Lancet. There were nine patients, eight of them completed the trial, all of them were over the age of 70, and he had a few elements that he thought were very important. So there's laparoscopic surgery, thoracic epidurals, avoidance of opioids, and prescription of non-steroidals, uh, avoiding salt and water overload in the perioperative period, not using drains, a single dose of antibiotics before induction of anesthesia, prokinetics, unfortunately we don't have cisapride anymore because it's no longer on the formulary, removal of the urinary catheter early and mobilize the patients. And Henrik was very astute when he wrote in the discussion that because of the multimodal approach, it was impossible to identify which was the most important factor. And so ERAS has become multimodal and over the years, the number of elements incorporated into the preoperative, intraoperative, and postoperative periods of planning has increased, and we now have anywhere between 17 and 21 elements that we are supposed to follow. <clears throat> now, I don't know if you've heard of David Bracefoot, but he was the head of Sky Cycling team, and he, when he took over, said that he would make Sky Cycling win the Tour de France within five years, and he was wrong, because they did it in two years. And Brailsford was a great proponent of marginal gains, and he said if you make small adjustments, each individual adjustment may not make a difference, but when you put them together, it makes a huge difference, and that's what helped them win uh, the Tour de France. And so when you accrue these marginal gains, if there's an improvement over a period of time, the, improvement, the magnitude of the improvement increases, and you get huge differences. At the same time, if you have detrimental effects, again, those accrue, and over a period of time, your results become bad. 
Now, out of these 17 or 18 elements of ERAS, there are some that are of proven benefit, and I don't think we need to discuss these. Uh, Pre-admission counseling, I think, is one of the most important uh, parts of the process because the patient becomes a partner in the recovery process, and if the patient knows what is expected of them, they do exactly what they are asked to do. We avoid pre-anesthetic medication. We limit the preoperative fasting period, six hours for solid food and two hours for clear liquids. We use prophylaxis against venous thromboembolism, antibiotic prophylaxis, prevent and treat post-operative nausea and vomiting, try and uh, do the operation laparoscopically if possible, avoid drains, avoid or limit the use of urinary catheters and mobilize the patient early. Now, ERAS all through has said that we should try and use balanced crystalloids in the perioperative period and avoid salt and water overload. And this was taken as gospel truth through recently. And this paper published from uh, the Australian group uh, last year, uh, on the surface, tries to debunk this myth because they showed that with liberal fluid therapy, you achieve the same results as with restrictive fluid therapy. And more importantly, with restrictive fluid therapy, there was a slightly increased incidence of acute kidney injury and the need for renal replacement therapy. But you've got to look very closely at this paper to see the, why this was so. And on the surface, patients in the liberal group got about six liters of fluid in a day, and this was mainly balanced crystalloid, and those in the restricted group got about three and a half liters. The urine output was, again, they passed about three liters of urine in the uh, liberal group and about a liter and a half in the restrictive group. And when you look at the weight change, there was very little difference in weight gain. So it was 1.6 kilos and a little less than a half a kilo in the restricted group. And the literature has shown that if fluid overload is going to cause problems, you need to overload the patient by about two and a half liters to produce edema and cause problems. And we know that balanced crystalloids are excreted much more rapidly than 0.9% saline, and this perhaps is one of the reasons for this effect. So no difference in the primary outcome measure. And then when you look at the composite outcome measure, again, no difference. But when you look at surgical site infection, there's a slight decrease in surgical site infection, and there was a significant decrease in the incidence of acute kidney injury. Now, there are some problems with this study because they looked only at intraoperative uh, fluid therapy and that on the first postoperative day. So we don't know what the patients received from day two onwards. Weight gain and positive fluid balance was minimal, as I've shown you and there was no record of fasting, oral fluids, or food. So what it really shows is that a modestly liberal administration of balanced salt solutions does not create a substantial fluid retention, and therefore the patients don't develop edema. And both hypovolemia and oliguria must be recognized and treated with fluid. <clears throat> now, goal-directed fluid therapy, again, in the early ERAS guidelines, uh, this was advocated because it was thought that if you use goal-directed fluid therapy intraoperatively, you reduced post-operative complications and also the length of hospital stay. However, Andrew Hill's group was one of the first to publish goal-directed therapy within the context of ERAS, and they showed that it made little difference. So we conducted this meta-analysis, which is just uh, published online last month, and we looked at goal-directed fluid therapy versus conventional care in patients uh, having colorectal surgery and monitored with the transesophageal Doppler. And again here we showed that there is absolutely no difference in outcomes when you look at overall morbidity, length of hospital stay, 30-day mortality, surgical site infection, and astomotic dehiscence and intra-abdominal collections when you compare the two groups. Now, Hendrik was a great proponent of mid-thoracic uh, uh, epidural analgesia because it reduces the sympathetic outflow, it, you get good pain relief, and also it reduces the duration of post-operative ileus. It can decrease insulin resistance and decrease inflammation as well. However, this large Cochrane review has shown that there are no appreciable differences in complications or length of stay. Hypotension and urinary retention were more common in the epidural group, and there was no increase in anastomotic dehiscence rates. What's been shown in open surgery is that uh, there is perhaps a longer stay associated with intraoperative epidural analgesia, and especially if you continue it postoperatively, because most patients get it for about three or four days. And a non-functioning epidural is probably the worst thing that a patient can have, because you keep increasing the dose of the local anesthetic or the opioid that you're giving through the 
uh, catheter. And then if it's not in the right place, the patient continues to have pain, they may get hypotension. And so that is quite dangerous. And what's being done now, especially for laparoscopic surgery, is that you give a single shot spinal and that has equally good effects. Postoperative bowel preparation has been studied for a very long time. And the ERAS recommendations say that we shouldn't be giving postoperative bowel preparation as a matter of routine. And this is largely based on meta-analyses which have looked at bowel preparation versus no bowel preparation without antibiotics. And these studies have shown that there is no difference in uh, either surgical site infection rates or anastomotic leakage rates. However, those of you who've been following the Nesquip data uh, would have noted that there are a lot of recent studies which have looked at oral antibiotic preparation in combination with mechanical bowel preparation. And this meta-analysis, which was published by us earlier this year, has shown that there was a significant reduction in surgical site infection rates when bowel preparation is combined with oral antibiotics, and there was also a significant reduction in the anastomotic leak rate with oral antibiotics. Carbohydrate loading was uh, uh, first invented by Ollie, who's sitting over here, and the purpose of it was to reduce postoperative insulin resistance and perhaps reduce inflammation and improve recovery. And this uh, meta-analysis that we did a few years ago has shown that in most of the studies, postoperative insulin resistance was reduced significantly by the provision of complex carbohydrate up to two hours before the induction of anesthesia. There was, however, no difference in, in hospital complication rates in this meta-analysis. When you looked at all the studies, there was no difference in hospital stay, but when you looked at major abdominal surgery, there was a, about a one-day reduction in hospital stay for patients who received oral carbohydrates. And this very interesting study from Italy has shown that although they could not demonstrate any difference in complication rates or in uh, hospital stay, what they really showed that if patients were given oral carbohydrate loading preoperatively, then their glucose control was much better and fewer patients needed insulin therapy to control the blood glucose concentrations. Now, albumopan is a drug that uh, has gained a lot of favor. Unfortunately, it's not available in Europe, and most of the studies come from America. It's a mu receptor antagonist and it is supposed to reduce the duration of postoperative ileus and therefore reduce hospital stay. Uh, it is an expensive uh, drug, and it costs about $1,000 for a 15-day course, but that cost is uh, neutralized by the reduction in hospital stay caused by this. However, there are some reports of an increase in incidence of myocardial infarction, neoplasia, and fracture rates in patients who have received albumopan. The post-operative or pre-operative immune modulating nutrition is not at present in any of the ERAS guidelines. Uh, there have been a lot of studies done on it, and again, we published this meta-analysis earlier this year, which shows that if patients receive pre-operative immune-enhancing nutrition for three to five days before an operation, there is a significant reduction in infectious complications and length of hospital stay. There was, however, no difference in non-infectious complications or mortality in these patients. And perhaps this is something we ought to consider, that we give our patients uh, about three, five to seven days of immune-enhancing nutrition preoperatively in order to improve results. Now, we know that the ERAS algorithm is quite complicated, and when we did this meta-analysis on outcomes, we looked at the randomized controlled trials and saw how many elements were included in those randomized controlled trials. And you can see here from the tick boxes that the trials had anywhere between four and nine of the 17 elements. So perhaps one of the main reasons ERAS works is not because of all the elements, but it's mainly because of the patient partnership and paying attention to detail. And as I said at the opening, that if the patient is part of the recovery process and the patient not knows what's expected, they will do what you ask them to do. However, again, Ollie's group has shown that uh, the results of ERAS are directly proportionate to the degree of compliance with the elements. And if the compliance is less than 50%, there is a, a higher incidence of complications in patients when compared with those in whom the compliance is greater than 90%. Similarly, length of stay and readmission rates are much higher in those patients where the compliance is low 
when compared with those in whom the compliance is high. So what do we need to do in order to resolve the dogmas and evolve ERAS? I think we need to constantly reevaluate the evidence. We should try and simplify pathways. This may not be very easy, but there are a number of elements that I showed you which are now part of standard care, and really they should be in all hospitals, whether they are doing ERAS or not. We shouldn't extrapolate uh, results from one type of surgery to the other because that's quite dangerous because what works for a certain type of surgery may not work for something else. We should stop being evangelical and we should look more at the evidence and try and simplify things. There is a need for large-scale randomized controlled trials, but this may not be feasible, mainly because of the Hawthorne effect, and it's quite easy to contaminate the control group with ERAS elements. And perhaps some would say that it's not ethical to have a randomized controlled trial because all the cohort studies and the small randomized controlled trials have shown that ERAS results in much better outcomes. We must continuously audit our work and look at the compliance rates. And I think it's not just hospital stay that's important. We must look at restoration of function, and this is a long-term measure because a lot of patients, they may go home, but they don't achieve their preoperative level of function for a very long time. And that's where we need to look at other measures like prehabilitation and exercise postoperatively to help patients recover. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tarip. So, uh, next speakers, I would reintroduce the Ori, uh, Professor Ori Yukis from Sweden. So, he's a, a professor of surgery. All Road University School of Medi Medical Science, and also everybody knows that because uh, he is the main hero in the, in the development of the ELS. And then also he is the prior president of Yasmen, and also member at Rajnal, and also he is the chairman of the ELS Science, uh, sorry, ELS Society. So his title is uh, ELS in the Elderly, Prisori. Thank you for that kind introduction and for the uh, opportunity to address you today. Uh, topic is going to be ERAS in the elderly. Uh, these are my disclosures. Um, so let's see. Yeah, why even bother with the elderly? Um, well, it's because they have a high risk. Question is if they need something different, a special care. I think we have been looking at them uh, in that way for a long time, and it was actually a big issue when we started uh, running these ERAS protocols uh, way back in time. People were questioning whether we could use the same for the elderly and the frail. Well, this was the first uh, guideline that we put together, or guidance, I would say. It was uh, 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 consensus more than anything else, and it had all these different elements that, uh, that Dilip was mentioning. Now, the question was whether it works or not, and uh, yes, we did find that we could reduce uh, complications if we had more of the elements in place. Uh, and actually tomorrow I intend to, in the Patinio lecture, to discuss uh, the issue about the elements because that's been uh, an ongoing debate for a long time. Do we need 5, 10, 8, or 15, or 20? Uh, so I, I think that we've just got an answer to that in a paper that came um, uh, that I'll discuss tomorrow. Uh, so uh, we showed that in one uh, unit and then went on to do it in 13 hospitals in seven countries, and we found the same thing. The more of the elements that you had in place, the better the outcomes for the patients. And this also now started to include the more dangerous complications, uh, Clavian, uh, Dindo, uh, uh, 3B, or higher. And we followed up on our own data and, and showed that there was an association between better compliance, fewer complications, and long-term survival in, in colorectal cancer, as you can see in this slide. So, does this really apply for the elderly as well? Well, we're operating a lot of elderly, so it's a really relevant question. And the question is, what are we up against? Well, it's obvious, it's complications. Those are the ones that give us the problems, and that's uh, causing the danger for these patients. So what can ERAS do? Well, we know, Dilip showed a little bit uh, on the first uh, uh, meta-analysis that we did uh, some years ago, and i just show you another one where they went into more detail uh, and slightly larger material as well, showing that overall morbidity was reduced by about 40% when enhanced recovery principles were applied. 
Um, surgical complications didn't quite make it uh, significantly. It was close in this colorectal material, but there have been other studies in esophageal cancer, for example, where there uh, might be a, a, a stronger signal. But it was the non-surgical complications that came down significantly overall, 60%. And that is quite astonishing. And those are the problems that we're usually facing with these frail and old patients. They have problems with their cardiovascular system and, and their respiratory system. And look at this. Respiratory complications were down 60% and cardiovascular uh, down by about 50%. So clearly, there's a, a reason to think that this might actually work in the elderly as well because they have a greater risk of these complications. Overall, in this material, the hospital stay was reduced by a couple of days, so indicating that overall recovery was better. So let's look at the elderly data that's available. Um, this is a study from Italy, over 60 or 70 years old, colorectal cancer. They looked at, uh, uh, they grouped the, the patients into ASA uh, 1 and 2 uh, and compared the, the different groups over here, but also 3 and 4. And what they did found was that the overall complication rates were actually uh, reduced, particularly in this group. Uh, and it was the major complications that were actually, uh, um, did not make a big difference in, in the two. So it was more lenient complications that made a difference here. Uh, and uh, if you looked at bowel function, um, it was uh, also pretty much the same but it was uh, an issue for mobilizing and being able to take care of themselves was different uh, in the elderly, a bit slower uh, compared to uh, the other groups. So uh, in this study, they also looked at what are the variables that make a difference for the outcomes, and they found that overall it was age made a difference, gender, uh, where men were slower, minimal invasive surgery was a positive factor, and stoma care affected the outcomes as well when they were treated according to ERAS protocols. So there's also a few case series where there's more um, uh, comparison between traditional care uh, and then moving into uh, enhanced recovery. We actually looked at that very early on when we started at Eerste Hospital. It's almost 20 years ago now because we, we had issues with our anesthesiologist who said, no, you can't do ERAS on these old and frail patients. So Jonas Nygren actually put together our own data to review it and uh, presented it at a meeting in 2007. So he, he, he divided the patients, those below 75 years old and those above, and with ASA 1 and 2, lower risk, and those with a higher risk. And he had about 40% of the patients over 75, and it was all colonic resection, so pretty standardized operation, all open surgery at that time. And what, what he found was that with improved uh, protocol, as we were moving from traditional care to uh, more enhanced recovery, also the old and, and sick patients uh, had the benefit of to reducing total complications. It was in particular the cardiovascular complications, uh, but also some surgical complications overall. So it seemed to make a difference for, for these old uh, and sick patients. And if you looked at the, uh, the overall situation, it seemed to be uh, the, oh, sorry. Um, in this group, not quite significant, but surely a trend, whereas we had a difference clearly in, in the, in the uh, 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 younger patients. So there was a signal that it might be big, beneficial even at, in, in the early stage, and certainly we could uh, calm our anesthesiologist down by saying it's not going to harm the patient anyway, which was important at that time. We also looked at uh, functional recovery, and here you can see that if you look at all the different parameters here, the uh, patients were having flatus after two days, uh, and if in the also in the uh, higher risk groups and the elderly, uh, and uh, bowels were a little bit slower, but uh, we were able to take the, uh, the drip down and uh, mobilize the patients and so forth quite quickly uh, in these really old and frail patients, uh, uh, which was quite astonishing at that time. So back to published data. Um, here's a study from uh, Korea, gastrectomies over 70 years old, 
and you can see here that the elderly were a little bit slower in their uh, fulfillment of discharge criteria uh, up here, but overall there was really no difference in all the other relevant outcomes. Uh, in the Swiss group, similar age group, this time colorectal, uh, there was uh, an increase in cardiovascular complications in the uh, patients over 70, but apart from that, uh, the same results as in the younger population. UK, over 75 this time, colorectal, uh, they call them very elderly. Uh, they were showing that, uh, yes, there was a, a a slightly longer length of stay, but no difference in complications. So again, not harmful. Italy, pancreatic resection over 75, feasible, but no really uh, big improvement over historic controls in that study. And in Poland, uh, the group uh, uh, here has done several really interesting studies uh, in combining enhanced recovery with laparoscopic surgery successfully. It's a small study, but it's interesting because they looked at the extremes, below 55 and above 80, and uh, you can see that the length of stay was not significantly different between the two groups, uh, and actually complications were the same. Uh, the only difference between the two groups was that the elderly seemed to need more opioids as the rescue uh, pain medication. Uh, well, of course, Henry Kellett, he's always been pushing things to the extremes. Um, he was looking at 85 years plus patients undergoing hip and knee replacement in a standardized uh, protocol. And um, he showed that the median was three days to have these patients home, which was quite astonishing. Uh, and 34% uh, of the patients had a length of stay more than four days, and the two issues that kept the patients in the hospital was anemia uh, or a poor mobilization, which uh, is not that surprising. And here's a study from Switzerland that is fairly new, over 70 years old, again, uh, colorectal surgery. Uh, you can see there's no, uh, well, apart from the age, and the comorbidities were much higher in the, in the uh, elderly group compared to the younger. Uh, and the surgeries per, were pretty much the same. Uh, and they were looking at the adherence capacity of the team to make the patients adhere to the protocol. And you can see that although there are some differences, some small differences here in some of the post-operative aspects like feeding and uh, removing some catheters and things like that, Overall, very similar outcomes again. So it is possible to, to actually run the protocol successfully uh, in these patients as well. And with really no major difference in complications, except again, cardiovascular, which seems to be uh, one of the big issues that we're facing for the future. There are also a couple of randomized trials uh, where they have compared a, a traditional uh, care model with uh, a or fast track, and uh, they're both from China. Uh, this is laparoscopic colorectal surgery over 70 compared to uh, 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 all the patients were above 70. 40 roughly patients in each group, similar um, demographics. And uh, what they basically found was that there was a faster return of functions, shorter stay, and overall fewer complications, uh, mainly uh, because of infections that brought the, uh, the, the complications down. There's one in open surgery as well, again randomized, this time um, uh, 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 over 100 patients in each group, and they found that uh, they had a uh, uh, shorter length of stay, substantially so, uh, and fewer complications, pulmonary, and again, infections, but also heart uh, failure was reduced in this, in this study. And they also looked at delirium, which is an issue in these patients, and had uh, a, a reduction in that group as well, in the ERAS group. So the other thing that you can look at is uh, what are the risk factors when you operate with enhanced recovery? And uh, so we did this study years ago with Ken Fearon, uh, and uh, this was in open surgery colorectal. And what we found in that study was that when we looked at the risk factors, Age and nutritional status, poor nutritional status, did not impact the outcomes anymore when we had a, a decent ERAS protocol in place. 
And again, coming back to the Polish group, uh, they looked at uh, uh, enhanced recovery in laparoscopic surgery. And this time, they were unable to show that any of the comorbidities preoperatively had any impact on the complication rates postoperatively. The thing that matters was adherence to protocol. And that was the, the, the only uh, remarkable finding of that study. So just to wrap it up, uh, age is often a risk factor and remains to be so if you're in more traditional care settings, clearly. Uh, they have more comorbidities and a higher risk, and it seems like the cardiovascular issues are the ones we should focus on. Uh, ERAS does reduce stress. Uh, we didn't talk about that specifically now, but it, clearly it also reduces complications. And it is feasible, safe, and it improves the outcomes in the elderly. That's what the data is pointing at. So you want to know more about the ERAS Society, please check out our website, and I thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Ori. So nice presentations. We are going to the third speakers. So oh, I would like to introduce uh, Professor Go Miata. So please, a little bit wait. <laughs> Slowly come up here. Okay. Okay. He, he is a, a director and a counselor in the Japanese Society for the Surgical Metabolism and the Nutrition. He is the number one expert in the ELAS protocol in Japan. Now he is uh, working at the <clears throat> uh, prior. He is a position is so Tohoku University School of Medicine, and now he is working at the. Uh, I'm sorry. Iwate Prefectural Central Hospital. He is the president of this hospital. So could you give us the, uh, the title is uh, uh, Operationalizing uh, ELAS in Japan. Please go, Miyata, Professor. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Higashiguchi and uh, Professor Yunkist. Um, it's a great honor for me to be here with the world famous big name, Professor. I appreciate this invitation. Okay, let me start to talk. Uh, today, I will talk about Japanese situation of ERAS on behalf of board member of Japanese Society for Surgical Metabolism and Nutrition. My name is Go Miyata. Go is my first name. It's not a statement to go. And uh, there are not any COI. Uh, the ERAS, it was very revolutionary for Japanese surgeon because so long time, I think that recovery process cannot be changed as homeostasis, but the ERAS enhanced it. It was surprising. Uh, even though situation is almost similar in all the world, I think there were three trend combination for ERAS spreading in Japan. One thing is a stream of desire for better recovery. For example, the rapid spread of a nutrition support team and rehabilitation for even general surgery. This dream was achieved by Professor Higashiguchi in Japan. Thank you, sir. And uh, second thing is a stream that wants less invasive surgery. It's quite a surgical issue. And for example, endoscopic surgery and robotic surgery also. The development of the endoscopic surgery was led by the demand, f demand for minimally invasiveness. Uh, this also leads to faster recovery. Third thing is a quite basic stream about medical standardization. For example, EBM, clinical pathway, DPC, and during this period, many academic society have created many clinical guidelines. Uh, ERAS entered Japan from Europe at the time when these three streams joined. The advent of ERAS in 2005 has had a major impact on Japanese surgeons. Many motivated surgeons tried to adopt it. 
the increase in medical expense is a still big problem for the government. But it is not so serious for the people, Japanese people, because there is a universal insurance system. This difference in consciousness may be one of the features of Japan. Benefit of ERAS will not be emphasized here today because it is a well-known fact indeed. Instead, we picked up some problems in the process of spreading in ERAS today. Uh, one thing is a forced discharge from the hospital. It can be achieved physical recovery and rewards the satisfaction of the patient. Early mobilization without enough pain control. It can be unbearable. And early provision meal without clear consciousness recovery. It increased aspiration pneumonia. Those, these problems are caused by not understanding the essential significance of ERAS. And let me introduce the JSSMN at this time. Uh, JSSMN, Japanese Society for Surgical Metabolism and Nutrition, had been established in 1965 as a research group for postoperative metabolism. The group changed to the society in 1981, and the project to study the ERAS launched in 2012. This is the design of the homepage, uh, but you don't need to visit it because it is written only Japanese language. By study the ERAS, we decided to extract the essence from the ERAS instead of creating another new protocol. So project name was Essence Project. This is S, not C, because this is an acronym of essential strategy for early normalization of the surgery with patient excellent satisfaction. Uh, don't mind it. <laughs> the mission of the Essence Project are uh, these three. Clarifying the essential significance of measures to enhance physical recovery with patient satisfaction. After understanding the meaning of it, we can start to improve it and providing scientifically based information on these measures, and providing opportunities to discuss how to improve postoperative recovery. For understanding the significance and the interrelationship of each, we started to disassemble this characteristic diagram and we rebuilt the ERAS elements. Boil preparation and fasting lead unstable hemodynamics. And avoidance of the instability, uh, instability result reduction of stress response, such as catecholamine and cortisol release, but not only the hemodynamic stress, short incision and enough anorgasia and also fluid, carbohydrate, loading, just before operation, reduce the stress response. And this reduction result, reduction of the activity suppression response. And avoiding uh, premedication or short-acting anesthetic agent use contributed. Finally, this achieves early independence of physical activity. And the mobilization protocol, no drain, no energy tube, and an hourly removal of catheter, and NSAID is contributed. So we continued this kind of works. 
Next, avoidance of sodium and fluid overload, simulation of gut motility, and mid-thoracic epidural anesthesia. That improves post-operative bowel paralysis, named POI. And this improved motility induced the early independence of nutrition intake. But not only these elements, prevention of PONB, preoperative oral nutrition, no fasting contributed. And also reduction of stress response contributed. Throughout these works, all elements were combined into four key factors. These are four extracted essence from the ERAS. Reduction of stress response is an important premise of all. Based on this reduction, intervention for early independence of physical activity early independence of nutrition intake and reduction of period of anxiety must enhance the sound physical recovery. These four essences are the conclusions we have reached. In the project, we published the book about essence for all medical staff, but it's for uh, only Japanese. And some English papers were published by our member, Professor Karibori, and, and that is uh, our uh, outcome, some of the outcome. And the next uh, task of our uh, project um, oh, sorry. Uh, for further improvement of perioperative care, the project proposed numerical objective ind indicators that represent the outcome of intervention result. As I told at the beginning of this presentation, we're concerned about the, that length of hospital staying can be misleading as a target indicator. Uh, to focus forced discharge, we would like to propose the indicator that uh, represent a physical recovery itself or satisfaction about recovery. In this time, QOR40 for the quantify the recovery after surgery. It was established in 2000. Indicator using 40 questionnaire form, and now it becomes a QOR15 is now available. And another indicator is V-score, we invented. And it is still under verification, but I would like to introduce it in this chance. That is easy quantitative index of physical uh, condition obtained from routine blood test. I will briefly introduce these uh, this is a slide for the QR40. Uh, by using this QR40, we were able to express the difference in the satisfaction according to the operative procedure. In this slide, indicator show, oh, sorry. In this slide, indicator shows lower satisfaction after liver, esophagus, and pancreatic surgery compared with colon operation, as we felt every day. And this indicator can show the difference of patient satisfaction among hospitals. Uh, this is the data from our multi-centered study that used the QR40 during post-operative period. This is... Uh, uh, this is the third post-operative day, and this is the data from the seventh post-operative day. And we found a difference among the hospital, even uh, just one line is uh, uh, one hospital. And the, from the first control period, 
there is a significant difference among the hospital. It is very interesting for me. And V-score. This is the V-score calculation table. It consists of sodium, albumin, uh, total lymphocyte count, and C-reactive protein. It is, everything is a routine examination, I think. And each element value calculate to the score, and total point are taken as the physical con condi condition of the day. This is an example using V-score for esophageal cancer patient. Intervention by staff, such as rehabilitation, increase the score, like this graph. And this point, this point, this point, the difference is uh, statistically significant. And also, um, the severe damage of operation, such as longer operation, longer operation, uh, which is uh, 10, over 10 hours operation, and with more breathing, score shows lower, significantly lower point. From this, it seems that this score can show the physical condition after surgery, and it can also show the effect of intervention. I don't want to say uh, the rehabilitation is uh, important. I want to say this score can show the effect of rehabilitation. Uh, anyway, as a next task, we need, uh, we need to establish a numerical indicator for further improvement. It will be good for clinical research to compare the influence of some intervention. This is a summary. I introduced the Essence project, and we extract the essence from the ELAS. And as a next step to go, we are searching objective indicators to estimate the physical recovery. It must be an important tool for improve future care. Thank you. Thank you very much, Go. Thank you very much. Uh, we'll attach to that, Ori. Okay, my pleasure to introduce our last speaker. Um, uh, don't need much of an introduction. Um, Andrew Hill, our president. Um, looking forward to hearing you tell us where you feel the gaps are still. The gap analysis for ERS, what is left to do? So welcome to the podium again. Thanks, Uli, and I'd just like to wish Uli happy birthday. Would we all like to sing happy birthday to Uli? Uh, no, okay, but uh, happy birthday, Uli. It was a few days ago, I think. You've now reached the age of retirement in my country, but in your country, I suspect you've still got a few years to go. And uh, I hope you've continued to do the good work that you've been doing for the last I don't know how many years, but it's been fantastic and a real leader in ERAS, and I uh, have him here as a great honour. I've been asked to speak on a gap analysis in ERAS, and um, I, I spend a lot of time thinking about this, and it's quite a difficult topic because it's the old story, you don't know what you don't know. And uh, so I can only tell you the things I, I do know, but there will be others, and, uh, and some of the themes that have been talked about today um, are, bare, bare, uh, are bare thinking about. So this is the fourth slide, you've, fourth talk you've seen uh, with this particular little diagram, and this, this must be one of the world's most highly cited papers. <clears throat> but when I look at this, I think to myself, what gap? There doesn't seem much of a space there to put anything else in. Uh, redoing that diagram would be quite challenging because it's quite evenly spaced, and to try to squeeze another thing in there would be challenging. And so my first thought was there's no gap. But then I thought of my own experience in ERAS, and I thought there is quite a lot of gaps, actually, and many things that we don't talk about, and this particular talk is going to emphasize things we don't talk about a lot. So first thing, compliance. Big problem, big challenge. And as Uli and his uh, team have shown, that compliance with the protocol is absolutely critical to its success. 
pain relief following laparoscopic surgery. If only epidurals were perfect. I cling to this little world that epidurals are the solution, uh, as did Henrik, but Henrik has weakened on this and I'm very disappointed in him. But epidurals aren't perfect and if you don't have a service that um, really does a good job with them or isn't prepared to recite them in the recovery room or isn't prepared to come in the middle of the night and recite them, then they're really very difficult. And uh, as um, one of the speakers mentioned, a bad epidural is a very bad problem. And so if we had some really good way of, that re replaced them, which I'm not really sure we do, uh, that would be fantastic. Other procedures, major vascular, major plastics, acute care surgery, there have been efforts to do some of this stuff before, but uh, acute care surgery still really lacks a good package. Um, and some of these other ones are still being worked on or uh, need a little bit more work. Standardisation. Why does everybody have a different approach? And I think this is something the Euro Society has made a great effort to uh, attempt to solve, but there's still problems with standardisation. Endpoints. We just had some, a nice discussion of endpoints, but too often we stop, stop at day stay, but patients still, as was shown before, they, they're different at day three from what they are at day seven. And in fact, at day 30, many people are still um, recovering from their surgery. So we need to be looking more consistently at endpoints other than day stay. Long-term follow-up. Uh, we've been using glucocorticoids now for a long time and now and as, a, uh, as something we give to, as, a, uh, um, as a, mo a metabolic mod modifier. And we need to follow up those studies to check there's been no uh, damage and there's early indications that people are doing that now. Complexity, I personally think there's too many components and I'll come to that later on. And sustainability is a big problem with these programs. There's a lot of initial enthusiasm, get things going, and then sustaining them has been a problem. And we need to develop ways to do that. And the ERAS Society, again, have released some very good software that's very helpful with that. But it does cost money and it is a challenge. These are challenging things to do. It is doable, but it's challenging. So <clears throat> this is a patient having um, a Vastin injected into their eyeball which is something you have to do every once in a, uh, several times a year for people with diabetic retinopathy and macular degeneration, I think, and macular degeneration. Why would someone be, allowed, be happy enough to have their eyeball injected once a month or so for something that's a preventable disease? And I ask the question, how hard, why is it so hard to change behaviour? And why does it seem like ERAS is sometimes like sticking needles in eyeballs? It's very, very hard to change behaviour at times, even when the solutions are actually more simple than the things you're doing at the time. And I've got a number of points that I thought would be, would be valuable to think about. First of all, I think a lot of people think they do ERAS. And it's really good to hear that the Japanese society are making an effort to say, hey, we don't really do ERAS, we want to do ERAS, and we're going to call it by something that we are comfortable with, and we're going to do something that's Japan-specific, and I think that's fantastic. But too many think, people think they're already doing ERAS. Well, the reality is, and this is when you look at compliance in many ERAS studies, what we intend to do is actually quite different often to what we actually do. A project done quite a long time ago now, which is one of my favourite studies, was done by Gawande's group from Boston. And they had a, a type of ERAS program, it's called the Better Collectomy Project, and they had 370 patients they audited, and they had 15 key processes. <clears throat> so similar to an ERAS program, but not quite the same. And they had 11 of those 15 processes had some degree of non-adherence. And this is very, this is very, uh, concordant with the data that's now coming out around uh, long-term follow-up, uh, long, uh, looking at people with compliance for ERAS programs. And fascinatingly, if you did all 15 components of their program, your complication rate in, colorectal, in colonic surgery was 6.9%. 6 that's almost unheard of, that's incredible. But if you only missed four of them, then your complication rate went up to 40% plus. And when you actually do a study and you're doing a prospect st a study as we've done, mm -hmm. looking at complications in colonic surgery, then these are the kind of numbers you often see. And in reality, even the studies that show, that say they're doing ERAS, often have this amount of complications when looked at closely. It's unlikely they're doing the full program. The second thing is Henrik was a little bit secretive about things. He didn't tell us everything. And you actually have to visit his old hospital, the Vidor Hospital. Have I pronounced that correctly, Ollie? I think not. How do you actually say it? Uh, 
He said, I can't say that, be dove or something. But anyway, uh, if, in fact, if you get on a, a taxi, if you, you're in a taxi in, in Copenhagen and you're asked to go to the Vidor Hospital, they have no idea what you're talking about. They just laugh at you, but then you spell it out and they can work it out. But if you go to his hospital, which I did in 2005, there were four things that I learned that I was able to take home to improve what was uh, actually, uh, we had a rather um, beta type ERAS program going at the time, or fast track as we called it then. First one was the key role of the charge nurse, uh, the dedicated ERAS ward. He only did it in colons, and his patients were Danish, and all of these things are important, let me dilate upon these. First of all, this is daughter Hort. Daughter is a very well-known and um, famous um, lead uh, nurse uh, who was the nurse who helped run the fast track program, or let's call it what it was, ran the fast track program that Henrik had designed. And she was one of those old school, or is one of those old school nurses who, those of us who are a bit older in the audience will remember from our own days as being registrars or residents or interns, who, you know, you did what you were told and, and you didn't mess around. And, and, and having somebody on your side when you're starting an ERAS program like this is very, very important. Uh, if you are a surgeon trying to get an ERAS program going on your hospital, then your biggest gap analysis problem will be whether the nurses are on board. If they're not on board, you're wasting your time. I might add, if you're a nurse trying to get an ERAS program going, you're wasting your time if you don't have the surgeons on board. So it is, it is a team game. You also need to have the anaesthetist or anesthesiologist and a number of other people. But absolutely vital is the, is the charge nurse on the ward. And whether you have an ERAS nurse or a charge nurse, I'm actually personally in favour of a charge nurse, but you need somebody who's going to work with you to get things going. And this was Henrik's foil. She's fantastic, and if you ever get to hear her speak, go and hear her. She's amazing. Uh, this, is, this, is what, this was the plans for the new Vidovra Hospital um, a few years ago, but the key point is here that they designed their care plan around, the ward was designed to support the program. So it wasn't a fancy ward, but they'd separated out the ERAS patients from another part of the ward. So you were going through your fast track program for your colonic surgery, you were in one part of the ward and they actually had a curtain almost down the ward and the other end was other things. And being able to separate out acutes and electives is very, very important. People don't talk about this much, but if you can have a room just for the elective patients and the rest of the ward is acute, or even if, like we have at our institution, we'll be actually a separate elective facility, then that's ideal. They also had a dining room, so the patients were not allowed to eat in their bed. They would have to get up. If they had a drip, they would be, or you know, a, a thing they would, they would be carrying it with them. Uh, they, had, they had their epidurals in and they would walk down to the room and they would all eat their lunch and breakfast and so on together. So there was, they were working on a team approach and the team not only included the nurses and the, and the surgeons and anaesthetists, it also included the patients. So it's very, very important to do that kind of thing and it's something Henrik didn't tell us but you had to go and visit the ward to see that. The third thing was they only did it in colons and it's not important whether Henrik did it in rectums, colons or whatever, but it is important that you don't have the same protocol for colons and rectums. They're very different beasts. So colonic surgery usually can be done without bowel prep. It can usually be done laparoscopically if you're skilled at that, but also can be done through relatively small transverse incisions for right colons and not necessarily particularly big incisions for left colons. Uh, patients seldom have had any form of preoperative radiotherapy or chemotherapy, and they seldom require an ileostomy or a colostomy. Rectal surgery, different beast altogether. Patients come to you in a variety of different states. They might have had preoperative neoadjuvant chemoradiotherapy. They may have been waiting for several months. They may have had a defunctioning stoma beforehand. It may well require it afterwards. They've almost always had bowel preparation, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And if you try to do colon and rectum surgery for the same protocol, you will fail. So if you ever send a paper to a journal that I'm reviewing for, and you wonder why it got bounced, it's because you had colon and rectum in the same <laughs> protocol. Just a tip if you want to ever get past me as a reviewer. And they did it in Danes. Now there's a bit of a trick to this picture because one of these people is not Danish. Do any of you know which one it is? The lady is actually from Tasmania in Australia. She's not Danish, but she looks kind of Danish. And the importance of this was that at least when Henrik started up his program in, in, in Denmark and Scandinavia, it was quite a homogeneous population. Not just, not just they all look the same, they're all beautiful like Uli, but they, they um, had a similar culture and a similar background. Now, many of the countries that we come from are not white and middle class, 
and, uh, and don't have a shared culture. Many of our cultures have, are very diverse, and so you need to be careful about the kind of endpoints you're having. Otherwise, your biggest gap in your gap analysis will be that you haven't been culturally appropriate. People have different expectations for when they're going to go home in different countries. There are different incentives or otherwise for things. There are different support structures at home. In some places, you may well have somebody at home all the time. In another place, we say there's only, only um, where, the, where, where both parents will work, for instance, then there may be nobody at home when the person goes home, etc., etc. So you need to be very culturally appropriate for your system. Again, unless you visited Copenhagen, then you did not understand that when you came from a country like mine that is very culturally diverse. The third problem is the attitude of surgeons. Now, I'm not going to talk about the attitudes of other specialists. We talked in Japan, uh, sorry, in, um, in your hospital earlier, you were talking about the anaesthetists. We all know anaesthetists are a problem. Some of you in this room are anaesthetists, so we love you guys. It's very important you understand that. But us surgeons have problems too. This was a survey of colorectal surgeons from Australia and New Zealand, and I would have been one of the people ticking the boxes here. But the surgeon's attitude about ERAS, admittedly a few years ago now, but it's still a problem, is that there were ones who didn't believe there was enough evidence. I think they must have been in some kind of time warp because you, you cannot, it, the world is full of evidence now. They didn't believe in it, which was perhaps more honest, uh, too difficult to implement or too time consuming. Over a third, uh, getting off of 40%, felt there wasn't enough institutional support, whatever that means. Uh, again, blaming others, lack of colleague support interest, lack of co-specialty support, etc., etc., And only, only 19 of the, um, or 29% said there were no barriers at all. And it still doesn't explain why there's that well under, uh, well under a third of colorectal units in Australia and New Zealand practice ERAS, as I think we would understand it properly here. The, four, the fourth one is the problem, the, 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 the problem of not really doing it properly. And this is the old way of doing things. You kind of you know, had experienced a few studies, a few trials. You wrote some clinical guidelines and somehow expected it would somehow transform into daily practice. Well, 1980s was the trial on preoperative fasting. Guidelines with the ASA, the American Society of Anesthesia, Anesthesiology, in 1999 wrote guidelines saying you didn't need to uh, starve people as long as you thought you did. And overnight fasting is still routine in most of our units around the world. You know, this doesn't, doesn't work. This is the way that things should be done. You describe a patient's journey through surgery. You start at the outpatient's clinic. And some people would even suggest we start with a family practitioner. We have preoperative preparation, surgery, anesthesia, et cetera, et cetera, through recovery, through to home. And then some people would take it further on to that recognizing that mortality in our patients often goes well, that the increased mortality associated with surgery goes on well beyond 30 days in many surgical procedures that we do. And the whole thing is uh, underpinned by audit of compliance and outcomes. And the ERAS Society, again, have a fantastic system that allows that they, they will work with you to develop this and then the software that helps you to do it. And again, that's the gold standard and there's, there's a big database which enables you to do research and put your stuff into a bigger picture and compare how you're doing and, and so on and so forth. And it's a fabulous program. And a, I, ha I'm not an, I, I don't have anything to do with it per se, and, that, and so I can say this honestly and without fear of being or conflict of interest. Um, an implementation strategy requires a task force of some kind. The task force is a time limited group. You develop your protocol, you peer review it, you implement it, you audit it, you look at the problems, and then once a month, once every couple of months, you look back at your implementation program, and then you review your protocol, say once a year or depending on your volume of cases. And all of this is helped by having an audit um, program. It's the audit cycle you need to have to keep this program running. So sustainability of a program is dependent on keeping up interest in this, because otherwise, almost invariably, it degenerates back to what you were doing before. And as was discussed before, if you start feeding patients when they're not properly awake or you break your protocols, then your aspiration pneumonia rate rises, your ileus rate rises, and so on and so forth. And so you don't get the results that you thought about. Again, very little literature on this at the moment, but this is the next step of things we're going to be talking about. Again, another significant gap. One of the other problems is, this is on the Isle of Man. They, they decided they were going to make this little harbour in the uh, southwest of the island, uh, this little island off the coast of the United Kingdom. And they built the sea wall, and they're all very enthusiastic about making this little port. As you can see on the right, uh, this picture is what that seawall looks now. 
So everybody was all enthusiastic, and then they lost enthusiasm and the seawall fell down. And this is what happens with the unwatched ERAS program. Again, if you don't watch it, if you don't maintain the energy, if all your focus is on implementation but not on sustaining the program, you will fall down and you'll end up with the seawall, which actually is dangerous to ships at, low t at high tide because this wall will get covered up and no one will see it and so on. So the analogy is important and, and, and apt. The sixth thing, this was my trip to Liverpool for the ERAS Society Conference. It was a great meeting. I recommend that you look into going to one of these in the future. Uh, ERAS doesn't look very sexy from the outside. The robot does look sexy. Now, I'm not saying the two shouldn't be there in the same room. In fact, an ideal system would be probably a minimally, minimal access type procedure done with the appropriate tools at the appropriate time uh, but it, with an ERAS program attached to it. But unfortunately, like the yellow submarine at Liverpool Airport, it doesn't look that great. Somebody, this is, this is, you know, this is their idea of the yellow submarine from the Beatles. I, I thought of a different kind of machine. I don't know about you, but that doesn't look very sexy, whereas the robot does, and you know, I would no doubt pick a robot over the yellow submarine. So ERAS has not done very well at looking sexy, and because we've got nothing much to sell. You know, we don't have a million or two million dollar product, unlike the robot, and the robot feels cool, and when you go home and tell your wife or your husband or your friends that you've done a robotic procedure, they all think that's pretty wow, but if you tell them you fed your patients early today, then really nobody thinks that's cool at all. So ERAS has got a bit of a visibility problem, and the ERAS Society have done a lot to try to solve that problem. Problem number seven is a lot of people, a number of people around the hospital will just have the view that if they, if they just kind of hang out long enough, then you'll go away. So you need to maintain enthusiasm. This is on the Isle of, Isle of Man again. I actually took a day out of the ERAS conference early. I'm very sorry for that and flew across the Isle of Man because I'd never been there before. But this is a tower built by the, uh, built by the monks and they would, um, when the Vikings, when all these people would come in, uh, they would all run up in this tower, block that thing at the bottom and the Vikings would all get bored because there was nothing much to do and they'd done their pillaging and slaughtering, etc. And they'd, the, when they'd all run off, because there's really not a lot on the Isle of Man to live for for a Viking, then, the, then the, um, the monks would come down and come out. So this idea that you just go up in your little tower and wait till the ERAS enthusiast goes away is very, is very, very common. So you just need to be very persistent if you're going to run an ERAS program. And you need to be in it for the long term. It's not something you decide you like this year and stop liking next year. Otherwise, it will fall apart and die. And problem eight is that I think ERAS has become a bit too complicated, and I've said this at multiple meetings, and for those of you who've heard me speak before, well, this is a common theme of mine. This was Henrik's original fast-track protocol that, that um, Dalip showed us before, but this was, in the, this, this was how he described it in The Lancet. We attempted to provide stress-free colonic resection for neoplastic disease in eight elderly, we'd already answered the elderly question, high-risk patients by a combination of laparoscopically-assisted surgery, so Henrik was right in at the beginning with the laparoscope, epidural analgesia, early nutrition, and mobilization. Nothing else. Uh, Delete mentioned a few other things that Henrik didn't mention in there, but they basically were quite a small number of elements. And the end result was hospital result was, hospital stay was reduced to two days without nausea, vomiting, or ileus. Post-operative fatigue, so he was going on and looking at other elements, uh, other endpoints as well, and impairment and functional activity were avoided and he made the conclusion that major advances in post-operative recovery, and this is on the basis of eight patients, can be achieved by early aggressive perioperative care and elderly high-risk patients undergoing colonic surgery. And I would challenge everybody in this room that when that paper was written in 1995, we're now in 2019, coming on to 2020, in that time period, nobody has actually improved upon this. And there's one or two groups that have got the odd patient to go home after a day, but I think we're all kind of nervous to do that. I think two days was about as good as most of us would be happy to do, and most of us like to keep them for three or four at least. But, you know, the reality of a very simple program, a very simple program, enforced by a very strict but reasonable charge nurse with a good team, all believing in the process, who are very, very into this program and very, very aggressive about keeping it going over a long period of time, they could get results like this and they continued to get them over time. Now, after a while, they felt that two days was a little bit tough on some of their patients, so they extended to three. Uh, frankly, three days is outstanding, and I think anybody who ran a program that had three days as their day stay would be uh, very, very pleased. 
So this is what modern perioperative care and colorectal surgery looks like. I can't see the gap there. I'm not sure that there really is one. I think there might be a bit much on here. Um, having said that, I'm not sure which bit I'd drop out, but I'm not sure I'd add a lot more to it. And there's very few things that have been shown that you would add to this, at least for colorectal surgery, at least for colonic surgery, that you would add that has been much use. And in fact, Dilip showed some of that before. Now, I've shown this picture to a few people before, but I, and I was joked that I like Land Rovers. This is a Toyota, best of Japan. And uh, this is, I had this old Toyota Hilux truck for a while. It's a very fantastic truck. And you can see it's very simple. Somebody had racked it up a little bit before they got to me, so it had bigger wheels on it and stuff. But it had the very simple 2.8 litre diesel engine, no turbo, no turbo. Um, it was very slow up a hill, um, but it could go anywhere. And I would call that a very good truck, a very good truck. Now this one is the American modification <coughs> of the Toyota truck. I would say this is not a good truck. The, the enemy of good is better. You can add a lot of bling to things, you can put a lot of chrome on things, but at the end of the day, the old fast track problem, fast track approach, had a lot of good things going for it. And we need to be very careful before we add a whole bunch of extra elements, which would make it more complicated and haven't had any demonstrated benefit. So just think that through. Don't ask me which ones they are afterwards because I don't want to get into trouble with anybody, but just think about that simple program. So in conclusion, implementation and sustainability are major problems. Implementation, I think we've broadly mastered now, but they do require some key components. But sustainability is a big challenge. Obstacles are there. There are people who don't want to do this. There are people who don't want to change but it's the future of perioperative care. I argue that the use of the term ERAS is, is actually, um, it's, it's now um, out of date. This is just modern perioperative care. Just modern perioperative care. It's like saying I'm doing a laparoscopic cholecystectomy. Frankly, we're just doing a cholecystectomy because hardly anybody does it in many of the places in this, in this room uh, with, with it open except when there's a problem. We hardly need to use the term laparoscopic. There are lots of problems, lots of challenge, but I, lots of problems and challenges, but I think the big challenge is rebooting old and failing programs. And Oli, would, I think it would be good to ask him about that actually when we do the, do the talk, because his program fell apart for a bit and they rebooted, and I think there's a lot to learn from that. And I ask you, have we lost the plot in some terms? Are we making this whole thing too complicated? Uh, just think about my old truck. It did the job. It wasn't fast, but it got there. That other truck, you know, imagine what that would be like to live with. Thank you very much. Can I just ask you to run back to the um, overall, um, you know, that ERAS uh, scheme thing, and then I'll ask all the speakers to join us here on the, on the podium. And we actually have uh, more than 15 minutes for discussion. Uh, I'm going to take the chairman's prerogative just to answer uh, on the issue of is this too complex or not. If you look at all of these different things here, and just for a moment reflect on one issue, I think everybody who's been through surgical training in different hospitals or just moved from one place to another will realize that we do things differently. Uh, so every hospital is actually almost unique in the practice that they are uh, doing. This is the issue, and if you look at all the studies that have been included in the, in the uh, different meta-analysis, they all have different protocols, like Dilip was po pointing out, meaning that some things were a given as standard of care in some hospitals, but if you go to the next hospital, it will not be. It was something different. This is our experience when we're training hospitals across the world. It's, the, it's a difference in practice not only uh, between hospitals, but also between surgeons and between anesthesiologists. And there's data out there to show that this is the case. So when you're asking yourself, if I'm going to move to an ideal ERAS protocol in my institution, look at the array of things on this slide and think for a moment, how many of these things is actually standard of care in my hospital? And what are the things that I truly need to, th to change in order to get 100% going for this, or almost. And that is what your target should be. And it usually is about three to five, maybe six different things that you've got to keep control over. And it's going to differ from different hospitals. And tomorrow I'll, I'll bring up a paper that is from Spain that just came out in JAMA Surgery a couple of months ago that really shows us clear data that this is the case. 
And like uh, Andrew was pointing out, it's very difficult to say which one are the elements that are the most important because it's all going to be up to where your starting point is, what your practice is. That's going to be the answer to that question as far as I'm concerned. I don't know if anybody else would like to comment on that. Nope. Yeah, so we can open up for questions, please. Identify yourself, and where there are microphones in, in the room. Uh, Christopher Bielecki, I am surgeon. Could we have the lights? Yeah, thanks. Okay, from Warsaw, from Poland. I am fully convinced with all excellent lectures, and I want to do and follow the ERAS protocol. But I have a, two questions. The first question, how is possible to introduce all elements of ERAS protocol having a shortage of nurses? Because the most important factor to realize the ERAS protocol, there are nurses besides doctors, besides surgeons. But nurses, they, are, they play an essential and crucial role. If, for instance, in Poland, we have less than five nurses per thousand of population. Switzerland has 15, and probably Denmark has also the better proportion, New Zealand as well. But I think in uh, several countries, there is a shortage of nurses, so it's very difficult to introduce the ERAS protocol. And the second of my question is, what about the readmission of patients after introduction of ERAS protocol? Because, the, to my knowledge, short, shorter uh, stay in hospital, the higher risk of, of post-operative complication, which happen in worse condition, namely at home. Thank you. Andrew, you want to answer? Does this one work? Well, thank you very much. Um, this was the, in the, I did my presidential address. This is the general surgeon I spoke to before. I'm a huge believer in general surgery, and I'm so glad you asked that question, because this is not unique to the colorectal surgeon or the upper GI surgeon. This is just general surgery. And um, the first thing I would say is, if you're short on nurses, you need ERAS. And the reason is, is because it's been demonstrated several times now, it doesn't need to be demonstrated a lot, just once or twice, that the nursing time per patient is decreased with an ERAS program. I thought that wouldn't be the case, actually, but the data is out there now. And most of the time, once an ERAS program is in place, the nurses love it. And the reason they love it is because you give them some autonomy. What you say to them is, here's the protocol, tell me when the patient's gone off the protocol, then bother me. Don't call me at three in the morning, Call me at three in the morning if the patient has departed from the protocol. So instead of every day you going around and making a bunch of, you know, um, bespoke decisions about your patient, the nurse has already done it. They've taken the catheter out because you've given them the criteria for doing it. The epidural's down, or if you're not using epidural, something else is down. They've given the pain relief that you prescribed. It's a fabulous program for nurses. They love it. The second question related to readmissions. I thought the same. Consistently, it's been shown that the readmission rate after an ERAS program is at least the same, possibly lower. If your readmission rate is 15%, don't expect your readmission rate to become 20% or 10%. It will remain at 15%. If it's 2%, it will remain at 2%. It doesn't seem to change. Don't expect improvements, but don't be worried it will happen. That will go away. The last thing is related to that. There are some concerns that people have if you're doing colonic surgery, for instance, which is what I do a lot of, or, or our unit does a lot of, is that the person will go home, have an anastomotic leak at home, and then you know die at home. It, I've had one patient who had an anastomotic leak at home because we have a good ambulance service in our city. They got back to the they got back to the hospital quite quickly and actually did incredibly well, better than they do when a patient has not been in there through an ERAS program. Um, there is a way to solve that problem, and that is by the use now of CRP. If your CRP is below about 100 on the day you discharge the patient, uh, it's very unlikely they'll have an anastomotic leak. There seems to be quite a useful test. It's one of the few things I would add into this project, but it's more about preventing readmissions from serious problems. 
So don't send somebody home if they haven't demonstrated GI function and if their CRP is rising. Bad thing to do. But most of the time, they don't come back. Any other questions from the floor? Yeah, one in the back. Hi, Peter Svengsen, North Zealand Hospital, Copenhagen. Um, I trained under Hendrik, so I might be a little biased here. I think some of the things we need for this discussion is what happens after the hospital, because one of the reasons we can discharge very fast in all elective surgery is that for geriatric patients, you need to have um, a program on the other side of the hospital, either in the family care or in public care, you know, uh, nursing homes. So you need to know what happens after the hospital for the geriatric patients. It's part of the, the gap discussion. And then I think we need to open a new field uh, because for all elective surgery, we have these programs and they work. But trauma and emergency surgery, that's the new field. We need to get these um, patients who do not have the preoperative training of being good patients to go and have a very fast education just after their surgery and get them out fast because we also need to lower the complication rate in this group. And I, th I would like to have your comments on, on the emergency surgical field and how we could lift that. Do you want to? I'll, I'll say something. It, it's it, just, well, just a couple of things. One is um, Henrik himself says that he believes most of the benefit is gained from the post-operative elements, not the pre-operative. I actually disagree with that a little bit. I think it is very important to set expectations beforehand. Um, but plainly in your emergency surgical patients, that's not so easy. But getting the post-operative elements in place are, are, are important. The second thing is, I don't think you need to do anything special with these people, you know, once they go home. They go home better than they would have normally. So, yes, it's good to have an appropriate geriatric service and have a good GP and so on. But these people are expected to go home better off than they used to. So, you know, that's a thing you can add to improve things, of course, but it's not something you need to add differently to what you'd had before, if you know what I mean. Yeah, we were, that sort of led into an issue that both uh, Professor Lobo and uh, Mayata was discussing, and that is measurement of re full recovery, not just recovery enough to be able to go home and to manage uh, basic uh, ADL. So, you know, but that's, that's a bit tricky, isn't it? How, how do we actually capture that, and what should we be measuring? It, I agree, it is very tricky, but at the same time, it's very important because I've had personal experience of this. My wife recently underwent major surgery. She was discharged on day two. Everyone's very happy, but it took her a good three months to get to where she was before the operation. And in Scandinavia, you've got a huge amount of facilities in the community, you know, to help patients. But in other European countries, this is not available. You don't have an exercise program and the patient has to decide what he or she wants to do themselves, you know. So that's why I said in my talk that we probably ought to move away from hospital stay or complications as an endpoint, and we need to look at functional recovery where you reach where you were before the operation. And I think that's quite important, and the Royal College of Anesthetists in the UK have now come up with this concept that the pre-assessment has to be really robust because there'll be some elderly and frail patients who may not tolerate major surgery at all. And maybe sometimes it's better not to operate on those patients than to put them through the whole process where they don't recover at all after the operation, even though they survive. Do you want to comment as well? You, um, you've been studying this? Um, I, I agree with uh, him um, because there are a various situations uh, for the uh, patient, the elective surgery and the emergency surgery, and somebody uh, can be received uh, preoperative counseling or something. But th that is the uh, reason why I, we uh, simplify the protocol just for principle. And uh, uh, if we cannot do the preoperative intervention, we do the, some, something after operation and to do the uh, to get the good uh, condition after uh, discharge. And uh, after, uh, on one point, I want to say uh, the difference uh, in uh, um, our country, uh, the health insurance. 
and uh, because uh, the Japanese patient stay longer uh, more than the uh, Western country, so we don't we don't need to uh, force ARIA. Okay. Yeah, I completely agree that it's very important that we, st we start to look at this black box because we don't follow the patients to full recovery. Uh, but it's, it's also difficult um, in the sense that uh, how do we actually capture the data? How do we reach these patients weeks after they, or months after their, uh, their home? We've, uh, we're testing different models that, uh, where we're able to, to look at uh, or to capture data on daily activities, uh, but also looking at cognitive function, especially for the elderly. This is important. Uh, many, many of the elderly actually have problems with cognition for, for a long period a after the, the operation. But I can tell you it's not easy to, to get 100% follow-up on, on these patients. We're, we're short of resources, as was mentioned, as it is. But still, I think that that's a, 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 something we need to look at, at least to get the data and to, to get better understanding. Um, another thing that was brought up by the speakers was, you know, it, when, when we look at the data and we look at the outcomes, and, and especially the, the study that uh, Dilip mentioned on fluids, uh, it's about uh, the context of where the, how that study was done, and I think that that's extremely important. Uh, maybe, Dilip, you want to comment a little bit more about that, because you had to dig in very deep into the data. In fact, it wasn't even in the paper. You had to go to the online uh, additional information to be able to find out what they actually did with these patients. And they were dehydrated, uh, uh, and, and, and that, that plays a role, obviously. I think that's very true. And it, it, it works for most studies published in the so-called major journals that you find all the hidden information in the supplementary data. And I think before we start implementing the results of these studies into clinical practice, we need to read the supplementary data very carefully. And with fluids, it's not just the volume of fluid, it's also the content of the fluids that's quite important. And in, that, uh, in the relief study, they used a balanced crystalloid, and we know from our own physiological work that a balanced crystalloid is excreted much quicker than 0.9% saline because it doesn't produce the hypochloremic acidosis and have the deleterious effects on kidney function. Again, uh, when you're giving fluids, probably a small amount of fluid overload does not make a difference. Patients can gain about a kilo or a kilo and a half in body weight, and they will still not come to harm. But they start developing edema when the fluid overload reaches about three liters or two and a half liters, and that's when they start running into problems. So I think we've got to pay attention to detail. And again, although I've been trying to do it in my own hospital, I've been unsuccessful, is to weigh patients every day. Because in the acute phase, any change in weight is a reflection of fluid balance. And the patients are losing weight again. That's important because they're becoming dehydrated. And dehydration is as important as overhydration in producing complications. Actually, if you look at the molecular level or the cellular level, some of the changes produced by dehydration are very similar to those caused by overhydration. Yeah. So, uh, thank you very much, everybody. So, so I think Andrew had given us a good problem, I think eight problems. It's, it's actually true even in the Asian countries, Japan also, but uh, I want to ask to the uh, 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 Ori, so because in Japan or Asia, a lot of the so elder patients come over to the hospital to get the surgery. In this moment, the big problem is the sarcopenia patient, too many, too many. Then we have to, considering before set over the ELAS protocol, give to some advantage to give to some branch of chain with the exercise and they improve the so, uh, uh, sarcopenia. And also, we have to the deduction of the perioperative complications. So how these, do you think about that? Yeah, I, I think this is a, a very special group uh, that is seen in, in many countries. And um, it's interesting to see how this uh, prehabilitation programs that are building up, which is really a combination of um, uh, nutrition, uh, extra protein, uh, and uh, also physical training and some mental preparation. 
of these patients. And it, it turns out that the, it's the frail and, and old patients that actually seem to benefit the most from these programs. And uh, it's about a four to six week program that have been studied and it seems to be uh, making a difference. I think the studies are not fully conclusive yet, but it's looking promising. Uh, so, so there's one to keep an eye on. Okay, thank you, babe. Yeah. I think a very, a very good point there, Oli, saying that it takes about four to six weeks, actually, for the effects of the prehabilitation program to reveal themselves. And that is a problem when you're dealing with patients with cancer. You've got to ask yourself, is it morally or ethically right to make them wait for six weeks for an operation when they've got, especially with pancreatic cancer, the disease can progress quite rapidly. So watch this space because there are a number of other studies coming out, but it is quite difficult. And again, the compliance with exercise programs is not great with some of the patients. And you, you know, we have the same problem. You're not going to keep them in hospital for prehabilitation. They've got to go home and do it. And all the facilities are not available at home and so it can be a problem. Look, um, <clears throat> prehabilitation is preached by a bunch of very evangelistic people around the world. I'm just being contrary, um, and I'm not convinced. So sarcopenia is a term that's come into play simply because we can do CT scans and see it now, but it, using kind of complex mechanisms um, in the past, the whole concept of protein energy malnutrition was defined and basically people who have got protein injury malnutrition are a number of fairly simple ways to measure without putting them through an in vitro neutron activation machine. 10 days of appropriate oral nutrition or if you have to give it um, parenteral nutrition basically gives you enough nutrition that you're gonna, you, know, you don't need much more than that to get you ready for an operation. Exercise, the prescription is wrong at the moment and the compliance is terrible. So it may be amazing in, in theory, but you know, old frail people don't go running. You know, it's just the reality of it. Cognitive therapy or behavioral therapy or whatever it might be, we've shown that you need to do a few sessions of it beforehand and you have some quite significant improvements in fatigue afterwards. So at the moment, those kind of work for me. Physiotherapy seems to be something reasonably useful to do beforehand if you've got access to it, get people to do some breathing exercises and so on. So, you know, a six-week prehabilitation program I think is plainly ridiculous. Most surgeons don't have enough patience for that. Um, and, you know, the anaesthetists love it because they want to put off patients all the time. Sorry if the anaesthetists in the audience, I couldn't resist that. But, um, so I'm not convinced about the concept of prehab. I'm convinced about some of the other elements and I think we need to have some very practical programs that last a couple of weeks, um, do accurate uh, assessment of nutritional status, give people stuff that they need beforehand if, if they require it, maybe give, get them to see a psychologist um, and possibly a physiotherapist and you know frankly you're going to get as good a result as you're going to get from anything I think. Prehab suffers at the moment from not having endpoints that matter to surgeons. We don't really care about whether your VO2 max is a little bit more and that's the prop one of the main problems. Okay, I'm going to rebut on that a little bit. Uh, no, I think it's good we have a very open discussion about this. It's good that we have critics uh, like uh, Andrew uh, on the things that are being done. I, uh, the data that I've seen that have been shown to be uh, important is that for these old and frail patients, they're able to, to move better, to walk better weeks after the operation. And that may make be the difference for them to be able to cross the street while the, there's still a green light. So things like that, it's, it's not surgical outcomes yet that have been proven, but it's functional outcomes, and we were actually talking about functional. Yeah, minimal, not much, but still, uh, yeah. So, so it's, uh, it's for us to keep an eye on. That's my final comment on that. Well, I think we just uh, ran over time a little bit. I'd like to thank all the speakers and my co-chairman uh, and uh, the audience for for staying with us and participating in the discussion. Thank you very much, uh, and now have a great lunch.